A question to kick us off for the Monday, April 15th edition of the Just Basketball Show, Wes Goldberg. Take yourself back to October. We are saying goodbye to the regular season. We are previewing the first round of postseason matchups here today on the show. But if I ask October Wes, which playoff seeding, which team's ultimate destiny in this bracket surprises him most, what would he have told me? I'm going to go with the Miami Heat. They were in the NBA Finals last year, and I know that there's this narrative that they always just turn it on for the playoffs and that they don't really care about the regular season anyway, but I like to remind people that literally only happened one time, and they were the number one seed the year before it happened. And the last time they went to the Finals before that, they were the the top five seed. So it's not like this team has always been sleepwalking through the regular season. There's obviously injuries are a part of that, but you just never really expect a team that was in the NBA Finals to end up having to go through the play-in tournament to make the playoffs in the Eastern Conference, too. You know, like, you could look at teams like the Lakers and the Warriors and the Suns and all the names that are attached to those things, but you also remind yourself of the context that they're in a Western Conference that we knew was going to be deep and good. Maybe not this deep, maybe not this good, but we knew it. So, you know, you look at what ultimately separated these those teams. It was like one game here, a tiebreaker there. But for Miami to be, you know three games back of Milwaukee, two games back of Cleveland. Like it was, I think that's gotta be the most surprising one to me. I'll stay in the East. I'm going to go to the Orlando magic. Hmm. It's a team that I know they're only the five seed 47 wins, but they were not good up until this year. <laughs> right. They were just a for bad a team, long time. Yeah. you know, for a very long time. Yeah. Not even just in this recent run, but they've never really been. I mean, I don't even know when the last time they were a five seed, would have been or or I higher. Think, Maybe you're going back to to Dwight. I mean, we are. That that's probably that's where it. it is, right? So, I think for that team to overachieve this way to weather Franz Wagner with an ankle sprain a little bit ago, and then even his his return not being great, how young they are, finding a piece like Jonathan Isaac to plug in after his uh, uh, problems with his health, everything clicked into place. I think their coaching staff deserves a lot of credit. But I would never have said in a, in a million years that they would be sitting there at five. I thought a play-in berth would have been awesome for them as a result, and here they are. All right, we have much more to get to. I love that you went optimistic. I love that you went optimistic. I was the one that went negative, but you went optimistic, and I appreciate that. It's a good way to kick it off to to get into these playoffs. Could have gone OKC, I think, too, in in, in a similar one, but that probably a little less surprising given the optimism we all had about them back in October. But we are going to run through an insane Sunday in the NBA. Biggest moments... Look ahead to the to the play-in. Look ahead a little bit to the playoff series that we already know that are going to be starting next weekend. All on the Just Basketball Show. Let's go. Welcome in to the Just Basketball Show for Monday, April 15th. I'm Brendan Clean. That over there is Wes Goldberg. If you're finding us for the first time, hit follow or subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. We're free and available everywhere, including YouTube. You can also check us out on TikTok, Instagram, X, wherever you are on social media. We are there as well. Today's show brought to you by Thrive Fantasy, a player prop DFS platform where you can pick more or less on your favorite players across multiple sports, including the NBA and NFL. Sign up today with code Just Basketball and Thrive will match your first deposit up to 250 bucks. Wes, let's kick it off. We have a lot of games to get to. We have a lot of future predictions and and vibes to to run through. What was the highlight of this Sunday in the NBA to you? In a day where every team played, almost every seed was up for grabs when we woke up this morning. What is the moment that that you're looking back on that, that hyped you up the most? First of all, I love that we do this in the NBA. I love that everybody plays on Friday night, everybody gets the day off on Saturday, and then everybody's right back at it on Sunday afternoon in sort of this like matinee type deal. All the one o'clock games on the East Coast, then three thirty Eastern uh, games. It's like the NFL, uh, the basically. West it's like an NFL it, Sunday. Why can can we just do this? Can this just be how the NBA operates? I know that they they're scared of uh, wanting to go head to head with the NFL, but here's an idea: stop, stop being so scared. Be more like Drake going at Kendrick Lamar. Be less like J. Cole apologizing all the time. Like, go after it, right? Like, do it. And then you can also have the night game. We don't have any night games, obviously, uh, tonight. But you can add two night games every night, every Sunday. Like, let's make this a thing. In terms of my takeaway, it was the game that happened at Madison Square Garden 
going into overtime, Bulls, Knicks, the Knicks playing for something. The Bulls not really playing for anything in terms of the standings, but they came out with a playoff energy, which you really appreciated. This is obviously a team that wants to it, it, they think they are overlooked because they are overlooked, but they want to get out of the playing tournament. They want to make the playoffs for the first time in a while. So um, I love that game. I love Kobe White and DeMar DeRozan going off and pushing Jalen Brunson in the Knicks. Uh, but the Knicks ultimately getting the win. And I think my biggest takeaway just in general from sort of the day's events are the Knicks climbing up to number two, bumping the Milwaukee Bucks down to the number three seed in the Eastern Conference. There's a lot going on with Milwaukee that I'm sure we're going to get to. But in terms of where the Knicks are, that makes their potential path to the Eastern Conference Finals so much easier. Well, I'll tell you what the Bulls were playing for. Their incredible record in overtime games, which is a weird <laughs> subplot of Chicago's season and the NBA season. They were 7-3 and three in overtime games heading into this one. Somehow, I'm not even sure how you play 11 overtime games in a season. That in and of itself is crazy. The fact that they're so great in those so games despite being below 500 is crazy. But the Knicks able to, I guess, buck that trend. And, and Jalen Brunson's the guy you want in that spot. I thought Tom Thibodeau closing in that overtime period with Precious Achua over mm -hmm. two other center options that we usually think are, are more trustworthy guys. And Hartenstein and, and Robinson was really cool. And just that Brunson-Caruso head-to-head -head is, I mean, what more could you want? A bucket getter versus yeah. a stopper. And that end, that end of regulation possession where Caruso is hounding Jalen Brunson all around the arc. Jalen Brunson finds his way in the corner, falling out of bounds to deliver a three-point shot heave. And it had no business even getting close to the rim. It touched a lot of different parts of the rim. And I was like, there was a part of me, I was like, this goes in, right? Like, this has been the Knicks season. It's just that shot goes in for the Knicks this year. That shot goes in for Jalen Brunson this year. And it didn't. Instead, they had to win it in overtime. But this is like sort of what the Knicks season has been is, you yeah. know, you get DeMar DeRozan at the end of that overtime period, missing like a seven footer that you feel like you would make every single time. And it sort of just rims out and the Knicks are able to come away with the big win. So it's been that kind of year, especially in the second half for New York. Um, yeah. And now that they're the number two seed, I don't think anybody's picking them to come out of the East. I think everybody's still going to, you know, mostly be picking the Boston Celtics and rightly so. But, you know, what the Knicks have done to set themselves up for probably the best run they've had in a very long time through the playoffs yeah. has been pretty incredible. Five-game win streak to close the season. They get up to two. You said we could talk about it later. Let's talk about it now. The Bucks lose to the Orlando Magic today as well, and they are the wrong side of this right. exact flip that we're talking about. No Giannis, that's probably the biggest storyline revolved around Milwaukee heading into the postseason. Doc Rivers, I believe his quote was, I don't know, I'm just hoping. When he was asked about Giannis returning from uh, the left calf strain is, is what they're yeah. calling it. No damage to the Achilles, but obviously you want to play that. Cool. I just still, frankly, cannot believe Milwaukee would lose a game like this by not only, you know, an overtime like the Knicks nearly did, by 25 points. Yeah, and look, everybody's going to talk about Giannis, and I get it. We still don't know when he's going to come back. Does he come back in the first round? If it do, if he can't come back in the first round, does it even matter? Or can the Bucks get upset by the Pacers in what this first round series is going to be? But I look at this game in particular, and I'm not thinking about Giannis getting hurt. I'm looking at Damian Lillard going 2 for yeah. 14 overall, and that was the problem. And no matter what happens, when if and when Giannis comes back, they're going to need a much better version of Damian Lillard. And I don't mean to kind of overblow one game here. He went two for 14 in the final game of the season, but it was an important game. They needed him and yeah. it wasn't a good showing for him. Just four three point attempts and missed all four of them. I thought Orlando's defense was awesome in this game. Jonathan Isaac had some really big moments in this one and just continues to scare people um, defensively. And if they're started not going to get in this game, st started in this game. And if they're not going to get more from Dame, this is going to be a problem. We, we tend to forget like Damian Lillard hasn't been in the playoffs since 2021. It's been a yeah. while. He's definitely starting to show some age. The stats overall are still pretty good. I still think that there's a good Damian Lillard in there that can be good enough when paired with Giannis, but he needs to get, he's going to have to be the best player in any in in like this Pacers series when Giannis is out in order for the Bucks to even have a chance. I've learned never to rely on any hope you get from a Giannis injury mm -hmm. given that I rooted for the Suns in a year where we thought Giannis might miss the finals, and he played in all six games, scored 50 in a, in that game six, and 
sent his team home with the championship, but you're not overreacting to one game with Lillard. This is from Bucks Film Room. He had this today. Lillard finishes his first season in Milwaukee with the second lowest points per game since 2015-16, second lowest three-point percentage since that season, third lowest effective field goal percentage, which would make sense, and third lowest field goal percentage since that 2015-16 season. So I'm not sure why he picked that year of 15-16, but that's still talking about nearly a decade. And this has been one of the worst seasons Lillard has put together over the course of that decade, outside of the one injury-riddled year where he had, you know, what what did he play, eight games that one season a couple years back? Right. This is... This is ugly, and not only we would have been worried about this if Giannis was healthy. Mm-hmm. And I will go ahead and say, like, I am thinking long and hard about picking the Indiana Pacers. Oh, I think it's 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 in not? that danger zone. We are there. Yeah. yeah, of course. Now, I won't go so far as to say they, like Damian Lillard's season has been ugly or anything like that because, like, those numbers are great from Bucks phone room. But let's also keep it within the context of we're talking about Damian freaking Lillard here. So yeah, he's got yeah. like career low numbers from like a decade. Like this is like a Hall of Fame decade for career. That's so fair, it's all but relative. is it is it okay to say it's ugly, given that he was supposed to be the guy that came to save their offense and pick them up by their you know whatever from their failure last first round and and be the hero that got this team over the hump? I think that could make you call it ugly. I think there's a lot to talk about ugly in Milwaukee, but they did finish the off- the, the year with the sixth offensive rating in the NBA. Yeah. So it's not like this thing has completely fallen apart. Now there's defensive concerns, there's coaching concerns, and all these other things. Damian Lillard is still a 24-point-per-game score. The, some of the percentages aren't great. You know, like he's shooting 43% overall, th- 36% from three-point range. So those are the sort of metrics that I look at that I'm like, all right, can this guy even go, like, toe-to-toe with a Tyrese Halliburton at this point with the way that Halliburton can play depending on what this hamstring is for him but um I don't know man I just I don't know how you look at what happened with the Bucks this whole year and it makes sense that they would tumble down to three on the last day of the season they sort of deserve it and um and have any sort of level of confidence with them in a first round series and you know what all this stuff you and I I think are kind of saying the same thing with Dame like he's still a good player I don't think he made the all-star game this year but is he good enough where he can kind of be the best player on the floor in a seven-game series the way he was for those good Trailblazers runs, right? When he was waving bye-bye to the Oklahoma City Thumber, uh, Thunder and, and things like that, yeah. where that's kind of, it kind of feels like that's the, the Damian Lillard that Milwaukee is going to need as long as Giannis is out. Now, if Giannis can come back and be healthy, then you don't necessarily need that version of Damian Lillard, but you still need yeah. a really good one. Yeah, you know, it it's the one it's it's a thing that's at this moment in time a very easy trend to try to pick up on and then I could come on a week from now and he has a big game one and I'm like Lillard's coming alive at the right, right. moment, right? Like right. we can do yeah. it whatever way we want, but look, 33 smaller guard, it, there is going to be a point where where it slips and maybe this was just a a, a tiny step back that is survivable for this team if other parts of it, namely Giannis go right, but He didn't get to the foul line as much. His finishing got a little worse in terms of frequency and efficiency inside. Like, there are these little things you can look at in addition to the big ones that I listed off. Um, I admire your restraint. Quickly. What'd you say? Good uh, good thing for the Bucs in this game. Chris Middleton looked good. Just want to point that out. 17 points on 15 shots, but... um, Portis looked looked good, which is a big one. Portis has been stat padding this last couple of weeks, man. Like, he looks really good, but yeah. Um, Those would be the positives. I, I would just want to say, and we'll jump to the West, and, and I'll give my big yep. takeaway from the from the day. I admire your restraint to not just lay it on Milwaukee for taking Dame and still kind of <laughs> falling at the finish line and, like, you know, tumbling over the black and white checkered flag and, you know, us both maybe picking against them in the first round. And right after you just said Miami had the most disappointing regular season. I was and you didn't mention that connection forward. at all. If, if the Heat... So if the Bucks had kept the number two seed and there was an opportunity for the Heat to win the seven eight matchup yeah, and then yeah. get to take down the Milwaukee Bucks in the first round like they did last year, I would have went to that tree branch, but uh, I I decided not to. I, I okay. restraint is a good word because another day I did think about another it. Another day. <laughs> uh, just to underline in that on the Orlando side of that game today too, you said it already, but Wendell Carter was not hurt. 
Right. They chose to start Jonathan Isaac in this game. So just kind of tuck that away. I'm, I'm not positive that it will ultimately, you know, matter in a Cavs series. Mm-hmm. But maybe some moments of a Cavs series. And then if, if Orlando was able to get to a second round series, um, you know, start to tuck that away against a, against a Boston or, or whoever it is. But I'll go to the West. The Suns own the Wolves yet again. Went up big. Chris Hine, the beat writer for the newspaper up there, had it that the Suns have led by more than 10 for every second of every second half that these two teams have played this year. So when I say own, I mean it. And they finished with uh, the Suns get the sixth seed by way of winning this game. At the same time, they locked in Minnesota getting the three seed and getting to play this team that they have owned in the first round. Avoid the play-in, get the team you want to be playing. Everything really clicked into place thanks to the Suns blitzing them 44-22 to in that first quarter and just riding that to a road win. A second straight road win that they really needed. A third straight road win, actually, that they really needed. So I'm not going to do the Do We Believe in the Suns segment, Chris uh, Wes, because uh, we've done it, Chris and I, a lot of times, and I don't think we're any closer to an answer. But when they play this way and they take it this seriously, it's at least a reminder of what the top version of this team can look like. And maybe when they play this team, right? It's, yeah. It just yeah. seems to be... The, this was, we were talking like sort of best case scenarios for teams like the Knicks and things like that. This was the worst possible day for the Minnesota Timberwolves, right? I was like, oh, we got to play this Phoenix Suns team again. Okay, maybe we can vanquish our demons and get over the hump against this team. Wait, nope, we got killed. All right, that sucks. Now, all right, well, the regular season at least is over. At least this game is over. Let's just go to the playoffs. Let's. Who are we playing? How did the standings? Ah, crap. We got the Phoenix Suns again for a seven-game series? Like, you can't feel good about this if you're Minnesota. The only good thing that happened for the Timberwolves was that Cat came back, and he looked all right. Yep. But, um, look, I don't know what it is about this matchup in particular. I don't know if it's just, like, Devin Booker sunning his best friend, Carl Anthony Towns. I don't know if it's just – I mean, I have a feeling that it's just because of the, by virtue of their five-out sort of offense or their spacing in Phoenix in general. Um, it doesn't hurt, help – it doesn't hurt when Bradley Beal goes off for 30-plus points either like he did today. Yeah. Um, but Minnesota is just – it's a tough matchup for them. We know that. Like, their, their size becomes a little bit less important when you're – when you're playing a spacey out shooting team like the Phoenix Suns. And so you take Minnesota's greatest strength and you mitigate it to a degree. And then all of a sudden it's like, well, can Anthony Edwards score with Kevin Durant, Devin Booker and Bradley Beal? Probably not. Probably not all three of those guys. And yeah. that's sort of why you end up in this place. And uh, I think there's going to be a lot of people as great as Minnesota's season has been. And as awesome as that defense is, there will be a lot of people taking Phoenix in this series. I think it's the West. I mean, yeah. we were in this we were in this position last year, right? People thinking the Lakers, the Warriors could could upset higher seeds. Lakers did that. Um but I think it's worth digging in a little bit on on why these teams match up have matched up the way they have considering they're yeah. going to be first round opponents. Nas Reed has played like shit. I don't know why. That's one thing I don't expect to continue. Like there's no real reason for oh, the Suns have an answer for Nas Reed. Like, okay, no they don't. He just has had bad games. Um, I think there's something a little bit to Nurkic as a perimeter playmaker to at least manipulate where Gobert is. I thought Gobert played great today, actually, especially on the offensive end. And this, you can see the Suns, just like every team, second-guessing, attacking him as they should. He's probably going to win Defensive Player of the Year. But beyond that, I think the number one thing I would circle is the Suns have done a good job turning... Uh, I wouldn't even say turning Anthony Edwards into a passer. I would say, because that's a little too reductive, he's a pretty solid passer at this point. I would just say making him second-guess himself. Mm-hmm. You know, just showing him bodies, changing up what, they're, what they are doing against him, not really letting him get out in transition. Just, he's not in a flow the way that Anthony Edwards can get. And that's only been three games. One of them was in November. But that's that's like the number one thing I would I would kind of tuck away if you're looking forward to next weekend and what this series could look like is have they solved Ant or is he going to have an answer and what does that personnel kind of chess game look like yeah only seven shots for for Anthony Edwards today like you just want more and and frankly need more right like I think for Minnesota to play in this series number one like Carl Anthony Towns came back three for eight overall, 10 points, went one for four from three-point range. You just expect that he'll kind of get better as the rust 
kind of gets knocked off here. So if you can get some big Carl Anthony Towns shooting performances, and then you need Anthony Edwards to probably take 20 shots, like that's what we're looking for. Like I think if you're Minnesota, you're like, okay, can can Ant go 12 for 21 for us? And if we can get that and some efficient shooting from the other guys and, and another good Rudy Gobert game, then yeah, maybe we could put something together here. Like the Timberwolves are the higher seed. They've won seven more games this season. Like they are, I think, just the better basketball team, but this is just a really tough matchup. And so, and that's what the playoffs is, right? It's it's very much yeah. matchup dependent. And when you have like somebody like Rudy Gobert who wants to sag back into the paint and you got guys who are just so willing, you got Nurkic who's so willing to set these hard screens. And then you got a guy like Beal, Booker, and KD who are more than willing to pull up not only from three point range, but from that little mid range area too, where they really are are, are really comfortable. You kind of have this whole floor area available with the for these these assassin shooters who are just willing to pull up in the blink of an eye, and even and that starts to mitigate a little bit of what Rudy Gobert is able to do, right? Because he again wants to be by the rim, and the Suns are like, cool, take away the rim because we don't really use that. We kind of just do all of the we do all of our stuff from over here anyway. So um, it's a yeah. tough matchup for Minnesota. I'd be fascinated. I oh I am. I'm gonna be fascinated to see how Anthony Edwards responds because win or lose this series, this matters for Ant, right? Like this is like, yeah. I want to see him go toe to toe with Hall of Famers, and uh, it could be really exciting. Whatever he does. Yeah, cat first healthy matchup between these teams didn't really make a difference but hard to blame that on him when he's he's just really rounding into form so yeah it, it's it's a the Suns are a team where I don't think you look at them the same way you would those Clippers teams against the Jazz with Gobert and it's just a glaring yeah problem but they do have some things as you just highlighted that can can make the Wolves defense maybe a little less than its ceiling but to your point, they should be favored. They should feel good about winning. I put some notes together for us for each series and the net rating differential between opponents, as far as the matchups we know now, I'm sure there will be some one eights that maybe buck this, but it's the most, it's the highest disparity. The, the Wolves outscored their opponent by almost eight points per hundred possessions. The Suns were just below four. Like, you know, right. they had a dominant regular season. I think they should still feel good. They at least put up a fight in this game, but... Um, not what they probably wanted here themselves. I had a question for us from this day, which is who won the Game 82 Shenanigans Trophy? I have some some nominees for this, which is... Well, let me just ask you in the East, because basically everybody rested their players outside of that Orlando-Milwaukee game. <laughs> right. Do you feel like any of this was strategic? Did the Knicks get screwed? Did they not want to get to two? Did the Sixers maybe feel good about beating Miami and they kind of wanted to play? Maybe they thought it would be Milwaukee. Like, where was any of this planned? Um, I don't think anything was really planned. I did love okay. the amount of disrespect that the Sixers showed to the Brooklyn Nets with Nick Nurse saying after the game, we rested Joel Embiid just to make sure that he was going to be ready for this play-in game. In other words, being like, we knew we didn't even need Joel Embiid to beat the stinky Brooklyn Nets team who doesn't even want to be here anymore. Um, yeah. And Tyrese Maxey went off, and he had a great night, and, and that's how Philadelphia beats Brooklyn. But, um, yeah, I don't – I didn't really – I think there's a way to look at it. I just – I look at the way the Knicks played against the Bulls. I look at the way that the Magic played the Bucs. Like, I'm looking at, like – you know, you watch those games, and I don't think anybody was trying to manipulate the standings. I do feel like there were teams – that the ones that needed to win came out and and they tried to win their games. So um, yeah, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna accept the Cavs. Shenanigans. What about you? Oh yeah, the Cavs. Who knows what the, the, Cavs, the Cavs? But yeah, the Cavs. the Cavs. Like if they had won, they would have put themselves in position for the two or the three seed. That's I'm true. not sure how it would have broken down in the end if they had won their game. But they bench everybody against Charlotte and then lose. But then it kind of works out because they play the most inexperienced group, the Orlando Magic, who I think people do wonder uh, about their playoff offense and just their experience and all that stuff. So the one team you could accuse of, hey, why did you need to sit Darius Garland and you know even some of your bench players and everything, it works out for them in the end. Over on the That's west true. side, Denver is the one yes. that confused me the most. 
because they had a, a chance at the one seed. Maybe they just felt like, hey, Oklahoma City is playing a Dallas squad that is not going to be playing anybody. That's a, a cakewalk of a win. We don't have the tiebreakers, so let's just say screw it. I'm assuming that was their mentality. But if they lose, I believe Minnesota had the tiebreaker over them, so they could have gone two mm-hmm. or three. And I think that they just said, we'll take whatever. And I love the confidence from the defending champions, but... They were kind of putting their destiny in other teams' hands, which is not often what you see on this uh, this Game 82 day. I don't think they would have minded falling to three because if it ended up, like, you look at Phoenix, New Orleans, and then the other teams that could possibly be there if you're the one seed or the two seed versus, like, you know, again, those same teams, the Lakers, the Warriors, like, whatever. Like, you didn't really know how it was going to end up being at the bottom of, of the of the Western yeah. Conference, so you didn't really you didn't. It was hard to sort of game your matchup because you just didn't know where these things were going to fall. And so I think for Denver, and we saw this last year too, they just tend to, uh, they just tend to like prioritize like rest and health and all yeah. these things. Um, but look, they they went out there. They, they Gilkic played thirty minutes. You know, it's like they yeah, went out yeah. there and and they took care of business and and that was pretty much it. But uh, yeah, I, the 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 West. I just thought that this year. There was no point in like trying to game anything. Like you, there was just everything was so up in the air until today, where I, it still took me like five minutes after all the games were over to figure out what happened and and who ended up where. So, um, it, yeah, we, it's it leads us into the thing that I that I was gonna hit next, which is: Do you feel like this? You mentioned how you love the schedule, you love the format, you love that we get this on the last day. I feel like this whole week, we've it, it basically is all lined up. We have not only these matchups, these big games, almost every night something feels like it has implications. We've had strange foreshadowing of actual playoff matchups we're about to see, mm-hmm. and yeah, lucky that way too. Does it feel like that is the result of the play-in and some of the 65 game stuff potentially, and just these rules that Adam Silver has very clearly made to say, hey... We don't want April to be something fans can turn off and ignore. We want these games to matter. We want the parody. We want something to be on the line every night. Mm-hmm. That's going to be the narrative is that it's working, quote unquote. Do you think that's true? Or do you feel like this is just a season where it kind of worked out and landed the right way? I think it's working. Yeah. I, I think that just because the play in adds like layers to everything right like if you don't have the play-in tournament then it's okay is the eighth seed in or is it can can eighth seed lose like you know you're just basically battling for the last couple of spots sure but instead of only just battling for these last couple of spots and like the play-in doesn't really work in the sense that i don't remember a lot of years where the 10th seed and the 11th seed are really going at it like by a few weeks out we kind of know what the 10 yeah. teams in each conference are going to be but to me trying to figure out like okay, is it going to be Atlanta or Brooklyn as a 10th seed is not very interesting anyway. To, but what is more interesting is, hey, does Philly or Miami, Indiana end up in that, the guaranteed six seed spot? Which one of these teams are going to have to go through this play-in tournament? I think it's really interesting that like whoever loses the Miami-Philly game could potentially lose to a team that has almost 10 fewer wins than they do, right? Like if like literally Atlanta has 36 wins and Miami is at 46 wins. It's not out of the realm of the possibility that Miami loses the Philly Miami game in the seven eight matchup, and then loses to the Hawks. Who, if Dejounte Murray gets hot, who knows, right? Like anything can happen, sure. and so that that just by in and of itself is interesting. And then you also add sort of like, okay, well, who gets the home court advantage for this play in tournament? Who's at who ends up staying in seven or eight or in like the Western Conference? Like today, also determined who ended up going from seven to eight to nine to ten. Like where it's going, okay, win, two chances to win one game. Or two chances to win two games, right? It, it, to, to try to make your way into the playoffs. So I just think all of that stuff has added so much intrigue to this. I, it was extra, it felt like, this year. But it basically has felt like this for, for most of the seasons that they've had it. Yeah, what I think you? that's what all fair. Think? Yeah, I feel like... One... People aren't chasing the 10 seed just like they kind of weren't chasing the 8 seed before. Right. But that just makes it fewer teams that are tanking, right? So, like, just in and of itself, it's like you add two more spots in each conference, you're going to feel it less because now and there's that, four teams in each fun, conference doing that. We had the fun Houston Rockets wrinkle, like, three weeks ago yeah. where they won 11 straight games or whatever it was, and they're like, oh, my God, like, do we have to think about this Which team was again? And that was just like, like the fun jazz, for a while. 
the Jazz last year were kind of right. that team, and then they fade around the same time. Houston kind of packed it in. They did it last and it year. It didn't go all the way until the obviously until today, but it would have been a conversation otherwise we couldn't have had if not for a play in yeah. tournament, even to just sort of like boost our March conversation a little bit. The other part, though, that feels lucky and exciting about this year is just how many teams suddenly got healthy around mm -hmm. the past couple weeks got guys back og ananobi comes back you have i mean donovan mitchell seems like he's rounding into form you had franz wagner who we mentioned brandon ingram came back literally today right. in his first game back carl anthony towns who we mentioned the clippers have some questions obviously Giannis is a question julius randall wasn't able to make it back but for the most part it feels like a lot of these teams are whole, which that feels random. I, I don't think that that's Adam Silver's doing. If it is, I hope he keeps that up. But <laughs> I like it, and I'm, I'm pleased that we kind of ended up in a, in a spot there. But yeah, I mean, I think these April games, I think most fans for a while were trained to say, none of this is going to matter, and we've at least moved beyond that. Um, all right, so let's go to the, the playoff series we know really quick before we preview some of these play-in games, Wes. Clippers Mavs is going to be the headliner. Mm -hmm. I think you just look at how each team has closed the season. The Clippers got back on track. Dallas has looked like a freight train since the All Star break and the trade deadline improvements that they made. Health provided, which is never a sure thing with the Clippers. This is a a, a series that could legitimately be a conference finals level matchup, and it has multiple superstars on each side. Teams that have a lot at stake with how much they've invested and traded away in their current rosters. How are you feeling about this series? Does it excite you as much from over there on the East Coast? <laughs> it's it's the most exciting first round series because of all the things you already hinted at. Also, we've known that this was going to be the matchup for a couple of weeks now. It's pretty much been locked in. So you got to know that both of these coaching staffs have been have started their scouting for this series. Yeah, we probably a couple already a couple weeks ago, and that's on top of how familiar these teams are. Like this is the third meeting of yep. sort of the Kawhi versus Luka versions of these teams. Um, and so there's already that familiarity. There's already the history there. There's the idea that like kind of Luka owns the Clippers, even though he's actually never won this series. And then you have all that kind of stuff too. Um, plus Kyrie versus James Harden. So you got some new faces involved and all these things. I think that, look, the Mavericks are the hottest team in the league. They're eight and two over their last 10 games. They look phenomenal. Everything seems to be clicking. I think what Luca has put together over this last month puts him legitimately in the MVP conversation. I know that we sort of just talk about like Jokic and then everybody else. I'm like, no, I might actually vote for Luca if I had to vote right now. I, he's been that good and and that sensational. So, can he be the best player again in this series? I think the Clippers can. They like you have just like the mystery of them. First of all, is Kawhi gonna play? Doesn't sound like Ty Lue knows, so nobody knows right now, except for maybe even Kawhi. Um, we saw, like, the proof of concept in January with this team, and then they sort of lost it. They looked like world beaters, right, the Clippers yeah. did in January. Can they find that form again? Because if they can, then yeah. Then Dallas has a lot to worry about. But right now, the Mavericks are kind of going through their big run right now. So did the Clippers peak too early? Are the Mavericks peaking at the right time going into the playoffs? There's just so much involved here, and I just think that the X's and O's part of it is going to be fascinating because you have two uh, X's and O's minded coaches between Jason Kidd and Ty Lue. You get two just uh, rosters full of smart, experienced players, and like I said, they already know what they're coming up against, and so I just think that they're going to be prepared for it too. Yeah, Dallas has been able to seal one of the first two in each of the previous two times they played. I, I can't say road wins because one of them was in the bubble, but... They've made it interesting, even dating back to when Luka was on his rookie contract. They play similarly, too, is the other thing, right? They play mismatch hunting, ISO scoring, go at you one-on-one -on -one ball. And Luka's just frankly gotten a lot better at that, even than he was back then, because he can make the pull-up three that eluded him for so much of his the early part of his career. You add the Kyrie element and the James Harden element, two guys who also tend to want to do that. I think whichever team can steal some points in early offense is going to go a long way because these are also teams who, because of that tendency, they tend to play very, very slowly, yeah. even against kind of their their better efforts. Sometimes, I think, from the coaching staff. They also haven't played since December. So mm -hmm. that was kind of in the early part of when the Clippers looked like world beaters, as you called them, which I think was right, and then before Dallas made any of their moves. 
And then finally, I think they look so different than back then. In a lot of ways, the NBA does because both these teams play centers now. This yeah. is not right. six seven ball anymore, the way that it was in the bubble and in 2021. This is Daniel Gafford, Derek Lively, Ivica Zubots, Daniel Tice, all these guys that would have played no role in those original right. series when Nick Batum and Maxi Kleba were playing center. Now here they are, and I think whichever center rotation, which I think both are a little shaky, a little limited in their own ways, whichever one of those groups can play better, I think that will actually go a long way toward deciding the series too, even if it's not the stars. I think it's a great call. And the other thing that's changed since those series also is the Clippers were so deep back then, right? Like we yeah. just looked at the depth of that roster. I think both of these teams are equally deep now. If, yeah. if anything, maybe the Mavericks are a little bit deeper than the Clippers at this point. Yeah. And, and so depth is not going to be, I think, an advantage one way or the other in a major way. And so what does that mean? That means it comes down to the stars, baby. And that's what we want. Like we want it at the end of the day. Who plays better? Is it going to be Kawhi or is it going to be Luka? And the win and whoever, and then of course you've got Paul George and James Harden and and Kyrie Irving and all these other names. Yeah. But like there, you, you're you're so spot on when you talk about Luka and how he's just evolved as a player, and what he is putting together this season, thirty four points per game. Right? I mean, this is it's the most anybody's scored per game since James Harden won his last MVP. I'm pretty sure like four or five years mm -hmm. ago. So mm -hmm. like we can't just like overlook that 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 this guy is just putting up monstrous numbers. And so at the end of the day, maybe the Clippers just don't even have an answer for it even though they employ Kawhi Leonard and Paul George. I don't really think they do. Yeah. I mean, if you're asking me, hey, it's going to be decided by the stars, which star do you like better, and that's your pick, I'm probably going Dallas, if that's Same. the only rubric I have, yep. especially because the other guy isn't playing right now, which is an annual April tradition, and, and that's unfortunate. I'm not trying to make it into a joke. It sucks that this guy cannot make it through a season in Kawhi Leonard, but the reality is he made it through April last year, Yep. And then only made it two playoff games in, got hurt. So that's a really big ask. And it, it's two teams that are both very good, probably the two best teams to be facing off directly, but still a lot of uh, uncertainty around the Clippers because outside of, of the that. Prediction, yeah, even just like outside of the prediction part of it, just like if you were to do like a trustiness ranking, yeah. the Mavs blow out the Clippers in terms of trustiness, right? Yeah. I mean... The, the trust part of that I was thinking too, and, and not to bring us back to role players, but the, the Mavs depth that you mentioned, they also have more guys I would trust to throw at the opposing team stars. Like Terrence Mann has to play the best basketball I think he's ever played, primarily on Kyrie, because I think we'll probably see PG and Kawhi get the Luka matchup, but that's one guy. Yeah. The Mavs, it's like Derek Jones, you got Dante Exum, you got even, you know, some guys that they can put on switches. You have some unproven dudes who they, I mean, would it surprise you if they saw the court? They just have like at least a handful of players, whereas with the Clippers, their superstars have to play awesome defense on top of being really good scorers for it to be competitive. Yep. It's a great call. Yeah, the Mavs almost just have like layers of guys that they can get to, which is unbelievable offseason by them, by the way. Just felt like almost all of their free agent signings on like these minimum deals ended up working out. You add a PJ Washington to the mix who defensively can do some stuff. Uh, you're absolutely right. Like, hey, Derek Jones Jr., Dante Exum, Josh Green, like just go at these guys and just you don't have to do it for 36 yeah. minutes. We just need you to do it for 10 to 15 minutes. And then once you're worn out, we'll throw somebody else at it and then they'll yeah. take it. And so that way you don't have to run into a wall either. So. Um, I probably would take the Mavericks, uh, if I had to make a pick on the series, but, um, it's either way, it's going to be awesome. Okay. Close out this segment by telling me if we both have Dallas LA at the top of the four mm -hmm. series, we know now rank the rest in terms of excitement, not competitiveness or okay. whatever, just what you Wes Goldberg are most hyped for top to bottom. I'll go Wolves Suns in the next one. Okay. And then uh, Bucks Pacers and then Cavs Magic. Yeah, Cavs Magic is is getting the, the NBT, NBA TV slot. We we can yep. pretty much just pencil and, and that, that in. You know That's what? all right. And it's okay. And there's going to be like Twitter dorks and stuff on NBA. Like, ah, don't sleep on Mavs, Cavs. Like, this is actually going to be a fascinating matchup. No, it's not. Nobody cares. I don't like, it. It's going to be interesting in that it's playoff basketball. It's going to be interesting. That, like, yeah. there's a lot of guys on the line of magic that I like. Like, I'm not trying to poo-poo the series, but let's also not do, like, this little quiet push to get Cavs magic off of NBA TV. It deserves to be there. We'll just leave it there. It's fine. 
be the change you want to see in the world and push for a new broadcast partner to eliminate NBA TV as a playoff broadcaster once and for all, rather than trying to convince us the games that end up there are actually, right. in fact, good. I just, I do the play-by-play from the games. Can we not do the studio, like the weird studio thing where I could tell they're watching it on TV also? Yeah. I, just do just do the thing from the place. Nobody actually works for NBA TV anymore, which is I mean they have a studio team, but that's it. They don't have like their own play-by-play people. Any regular season game that's there, it's just the local broadcast piped through. So I don't really know why we're doing that in general, but yeah, let's get NBC or Apple or somebody to rescue us from from that hell and also the fans that have to deal with that. But all right, we're going to go to the play-ins next first. Homage is an ultra-comfortable specialty apparel company with NBA, WNBA licenses that use vintage-inspired designs to pay homage to the greatest stories, traditions, and figures across sports, music, and pop culture. Mother's Day coming up, Father's Day after that. Get your parents something wonderful. Maybe if you're rooting for one of these NBA playoff teams, have them root along with you. Little hoodie, little shirt, whatever you like. Use the link below when you do. Make your purchase. And support the Just Basketball Show. A little money kicks back to us for each and every purchase. We appreciate you. All right, Wes. Mm. Let's go west then east for the play-in. Okay. Has it always been this way that it's conference by day? I remembered it being like no. both seven, eight games, and then both nine, ten games. This is the first. Yep, you're at, you're exactly okay. right. This okay. is the first time there is a uh, rumor that there's something happening in Philadelphia at the Wells Fargo Center that. Had Got to it. push this game to somewhere else, whatever. I actually think this is a better model than having both of the seven, eight games. I'd rather just see what the conference is going to be. You know, I, I like just getting the West out of the way and then the East yeah. out of the way. And then we just, we all stay on one coast and that's fine. And it's the West gets a little more rest, but it's not like individual teams from each conference are getting more or less rest. So it's, it adds up to the same thing, but yeah, there's that. Right. Yeah. There's no rest advantage one way or the other. It no. just is what it is. Yeah rematch to kick us off here of today's mm-hmm. Lakers Pelicans game which if you're a Pelicans fan terrifies you and I think that this was real in addition to the in-season tournament game that these two teams played I think it's very legit that the Lakers are a terrible matchup for New Orleans and I would heavily favor the Lakers here even though that's a big bummer given how well the Pelicans have played all year Big time bummer. Uh I agree with you. The Lakers just have so much size that they could just put in yeah. front of Zion so those those four foot, three foot little floaters that Zion's like always getting to become five foot floaters, six foot floaters, seven foot floaters. It's a little bit more difficult. The degree of difficulty just gets a little bit higher. And so fewer of those shots go in. And you even look at his line today, he goes uh, four for 13 overall, and he missed a lot of those kinds of shots. So they have all the length in the world between LeBron, obviously, who takes this matchup personally. Uh, and then you have the Anthony Davis, Rui Hachimura now part of the starting lineup and they just kind of have those guys. And then even off the bench, you know, you get your Jackson Hayes minutes and, and all these other guys too. So they're able to just stack the paint and yeah. kind of take away New Orleans' greatest strength. And unless the Pelicans get like a night from the – like uh, CJ McCollum goes four for nine from three-point range. Herb Jones goes four for seven. Those are good. It's not good enough, right? Like they kind of have to be yeah. blistering from three-point range to kind of win this matchup, especially especially when the when the Lakers' offense is sort of humming the way it is now. Exactly. You took the words out of my mouth. I think CJ McCollum, he got hot in this game, relatively speaking. He needs to like double that output from deep. I mean, he's really the only great shooter on this team, Mm -hmm. you know, consistently great shooter. Now that Jordan Hawkins, the rookie's not in the rotation, the big white dude, Matt Ryan's not playing anymore. Like they had a a phase of their season where those guys were in there. They're not anymore. It has to be CJ. I think, um, couple reasons for optimism based on the game we did see today, despite it being so lopsided. Zion is the type of player, I think he's graduated to the level where even the things you think are weak points for him, he's going to adjust, yeah. right? So defensively, second half, he takes LeBron. At least provides some resistance, forces some turnovers, has some moments. He has to be an option against LeBron because physically, they just don't have other dudes who can match up with LeBron James. And then offensively, You always see this with Zion. First half, he's trying to beat his man and finish through the help. Second half, he's going to try to get that help switched on to him and blow by that guy. But we've seen this with Anthony Davis before, right? It's like, you can do that, but it takes so much time and so much effort to move AD where you want him to be 
that he's kind of already won by that point. So right. I'm already rehedging against myself, but I guess that <laughs> illustrates how ugly of a matchup this is, despite my belief that Zion is ready for what will be his first postseason taste here. Yeah, almost good to knock out the bad Zion game in this one, knowing that you probably need it in this play-in matchup. He's going to have a better game. He's not going to play like he just did. Uh, you're, this, the C.J. McCollum part, he's not just their best shooter. He's their best. He's like their only pull-up threat. You know, even like Herb mm -hmm. Jones and Trey Murphy, like they're great at catch and shoot stuff. But C.J. McCollum is the one who you could pull the, the big man out, come across that screen, and put that pressure on somebody like Anthony Davis where it's like, hey, you need to come up all the way to the level of the screen. or Because if you don't, I'm pulling up, and I'm firing yeah. this sucker. So... And and when you do do that, by the way, now I can maybe find Zion cutting backdoor, and now I eliminate some of that size that was giving us a problem before. So I thought Willie Green has done an awesome job in terms of coaching. It's kind of great for them in a weird way that they play this game once, and then they get to turn around and play it again because they got fresh film on it. They can make fresh adjustments, and they can go for it. But um, they're going to need – and like this is not news. It's all the playing games. There's a certain level of variance that comes with it. If they make more threes than the Lakers do – then they'll have a pretty good chance. I mean, they did tonight, and and they yeah. lost the game. So it's not that's not the only thing. But um, yeah, I, I would expect a bounce back game for Zion too. Also, just worth noting that Anthony Davis left this game in the fourth quarter with an apparent back injury. Does not sound like it's going to be a serious thing, but just worth uh, monitoring. Points in the paint in this game. In the first half, I believe the Pelicans had twelve. Mm. They've closed with forty-two. Not the worst number you've ever seen. But on the Lakers' side, 68 points in the paint. So that interior dominance is not just when the Lakers are on defense. It's also the fact that the Pelican centers are Larry Nance and Jonas Valanciunas, and Anthony Davis could get 20 points in the paint per game if he wanted to. So Anthony early Davis, line, by the way, sorry, tell, telling reporters afterwards that there's no doubt he's playing. So we got that. And he's been a soldier all year. So yep. I, you feel a lot more optimism that he'll be ready than maybe you would have three, four years ago. Um yeah, early line, basically a pick em for this game. I think mm. that will lean Lakers by the end, despite New Orleans being the home team. Public money, baby. Warriors-Kings. Rematch of the first round. I watched the Kings on Friday night play against the Suns, Wes, in a game that the Suns had no business stealing, and that was happened in large part because Sacramento's late-game offense completely sputtered. They felt like they did not have answers, despite them being a machine last year. And it feels like they're ticked down from overpowering holy shit offense to pretty mediocre, all things considered, hasn't gotten enough attention because we still yeah. just think, oh, they're the quick, lightning fast, get up threes kings. And they have two, you know, offensive superstars and they'll be able to put up 120 no matter what. And De'Aaron Fox is the clutch player of the year. A lot of those things haven't really been true this year. And that's a big part of why I trust the Warriors in another team on the road that I'm going to feel pretty good about picking heading into yeah. these games. The Warriors were able to rest some of their guys because they've been they were pretty much locked into this, so um, they're going to be rested. Sacramento, once they lost uh, Malik Monk, and even when they lost Kevin Herter earlier in the year, they just don't really have that other thing in the offense. Yeah. And so, yeah, the Deer and Fox, Demonte Savonis pick and roll a year ago was new and it was hard to stop and then everybody got film on it and saw it at least once and they're like oh it's a really good pick and roll partnership but at the end of the day it's just pick and roll and we we could yeah. stop this and when there's not that outlet of even like you know a Kevin Herter who shot better last year than he did this year before he got hurt or Malik Monk this year was helpful but he wasn't really like that extra wrinkle he was just sort of lifting the offense when one of those guys weren't really on the floor as a six man and then the leap that they were trying to get from Keegan Murray never really happened. Like, his three-point shooting went down. His overall field goal percentage is about the same. Like, he never really took that leap. And it just felt like, at least through the first couple of months of the season, like, Mike Brown was trying to figure out, okay, what's the next thing for this offense? What's our extra layer? Like, what else can we get to beyond the pick and roll? And they were running a lot of offense for Keegan Murray earlier in the year, and they don't run nearly as much offense for Keegan Murray now. Probably in part because maybe he just doesn't deserve it. Maybe he just didn't take that leap and it didn't work out and they're trying to find other things to experiment with. And then you couple that yeah. with the injuries that ultimately happened. You're like, oh, cool. Like the one thing that we did find, which was Malik Monk can just go nuclear every once in a while, is no longer on the table anymore in terms yeah. of an option. So 
just a tough thing. Uh, I don't think that anybody wants to see Sacramento win this game, including Sacramento Kings fans. I think they're just like ready to kill this season with fire too, and, and kind of lick their wounds in the off season and just move it along. Yeah, the Kings are Kings fans are frustrated with how little their front office has done, and I think some moves along the way would have gone a, a really long way mm. to not having them be so at the whim of injuries to role players. You talk about wrinkles, and yeah, Keegan Murray's handle's just not there. To me, that's the big thing. He doesn't trust himself to drive. And so you, what are you going to do? You can have him pull up for a bunch of threes, or you can have him catch and shoot threes, or you can get it to him in transition. That's, that's the ceiling he's hitting, and I think he has to develop from there. The other wrinkle that they thought they might have had along the way is De'Aaron Fox three-point shooting, especially pull-up three-point shooting. It's improved a bit, but it's nowhere near the 40-plus percent that it started out the season at. So that extra layer to what he can do when he does get that handoff from Sabonis or he does get that screen from Sabonis is gone. Not to mention, Wes, Golden State kind of bottled that up when it was at its peak right. last playoffs, and right. Sabonis had a terrible series. So I'm not even sure if they need to do this, but I wouldn't be surprised just as another note on this game if Kevon Looney gets dusted off. He was getting DNPs down the stretch. He was a huge part of what they were able to do to Sabonis. It wouldn't surprise me if Steve Kerr said, Kavon, you're playing 30 tonight. Get out there. And that that goes a long way to deciding this game. I think we could definitely see that between Kavon Looney and his physicality and then obviously the Draymond Green part of this. Like, that's just a tough matchup for Sabonis to go up against for 48 minutes or however many minutes Sabonis ends up playing. But um, Steve Kerr pretty much said this a month ago when he benched Kavon Looney was, we're going to need him for the playoffs. We're just trying to get Trace Jackson Davis some reps as we get into yeah. the postseason here. And Trace Jackson Davis has been awesome for them, by the way. He's definitely taken advantage of those reps. And now, all of a sudden, it feels like Golden State has some options at center, where at the beginning of the year, it felt like at times they just had nobody that was playable at that position. And now yeah. it feels like they have a couple of pretty good options, at least just for this one-game matchup. Now, sure. how does Looney and Trace Jackson Davis stack up against the better teams in the West? A very different story than the Sacramento Kings. Not to write the Kings obituary now. I'm not doing that. But just from a team building perspective, like if your offense is going to be limited in this way, and then you look at maybe needing to make a move this offseason, if you need somebody who's a, like more of sort of some sort of offensive creator or something like yeah. that, you're going to be limited in your options too because your two best players are negatives on defense. And so it's not like you can just go out there and be like, okay, yeah, let's go, go let's go get in a third kind of scorer type who's also going to not be good defensively because now you're yeah. you kind of you're, you're putting a really hard low ceiling on what you could be defensively too so this front office has its work cut out for them the nba is so unforgiving yep. how quickly they went from oh the kings light the beam to you fucked it up <laughs> yeah, you didn't yep. improve the team you gave Sabonis an extension that maybe is going to look like an overpay he's a really hard center to fit next to and you're going to flame out in the the play in and figure it out Monty McNair that's I, just I, so brutal it, no, you're absolutely right because that is the perception I will defend Sacramento from not making any major moves at the deadline or, or really anything for two years because it's been such a mess for two decades there and you finally yeah. figured out something that was good I think you want to exhaust the options you have in-house first. Let's find out sure. what Keegan Murray is before we start making a bunch of moves. Let's figure out like what we could do with Malik Monk, Aaron Fox, and Sabonis and all these things. Like Exhaust the in-house options before you start spending your own money on stuff. And then and, and now you can do that. Look, the Kings were never coming out of the West. We knew that no matter what. And so, all right, you got a two-year sample of what this team is. That's a good, that's, that's a good amount of, of stuff yeah. to review. Now you review it and you make whatever changes you need in the offseason. It's fine. And then you keep the beam lit next year. <laughs> keep the beam lit is really priority number one. Yeah. They look too, like we know they were in on Siakam. They can only make the moves that are there. If he yep. wasn't going to extend there, but he was going to extend in Indiana, are we really going to rip them for not trading for a guy who didn't have any intention of staying with the team? Like that would have been a mistake we probably would have laughed at too. So you can't just will things into existence, but they are in a, in a, questionable spot and we'll see how they respond that game's not going to be a blowout the kings will fight it will be a, a good game they are at home but uh, i think we're leaning the same direction all right on to the east where we get back to your beloved miami heat and the sixers somehow west won the final eight games of the season got Embiid back integrated him got melton back integrated him the vibes were riding very very high in philly 
The rights to Ricky Sanchez guys are selling the year t-shirts to uh, inspire optimism in their fan base, and yet they still don't get the six seed. How do you think they stack up? You saw them, these two teams face off not too long ago in what I believe was Embiid's second game back from yep. injury a couple Thursdays ago. Is it that game that you feel like is going to teach us lessons or just these two teams' seasons? Because there's a lot to go off of with that as well. When Philadelphia has Joel Embiid, they're really good. And Joel Embiid has not even had to be 100% for Philadelphia to be really good as long as they have him. And so that's where we're at. They're undefeated since Joel Embiid came back. Uh, Tyrese Maxey's also healthy. That's a big part of it. The Anthony and the Melton's back in the lineup. That's a big part of it, too. This team's just working. And it worked before Joel Embiid got hurt. And he came back. And it wasn't seamless because that's not fair. He was still playing in those like little five- and six-minute bursts. Uh, the conditioning wasn't necessarily where it needed to be, and that was understandable. But it looks like it's getting back there. And this team is – it was a juggernaut before we got hurt. That was a little bit before the Celtics really started to pull away in terms of wins and net rating and all that kind of stuff. But I still think that the Sixers are legitimately a dangerous team in the Eastern Conference that I might say is the second best team in the in the East right now, just despite their record. This team is awesome. Yeah. And uh, in this game against Miami, they're going to be favored. They should be favored. I think they'll win the game. It's in Philadelphia, which is a big um, a big development for them. They go in, like you mentioned, the game I was at in Miami the other night. And they go into Miami and win that game and Joel Embiid's second game back. That's why they're hosting this game and not having to travel and put Joel Embiid on a plane and travel to Miami for it either. So it it didn't break right in terms of like the grand scheme of things for the Sixers because like their MVP got hurt and that kind of torpedoed their season for a while. But they're back at the right everybody's back at the right time. They're playing their some of their best basketball at the right time. Joel Embiid is rounding into form. And if they win this game, they're gonna get a half week off before the playoffs start. And if they win this, they'll be the seventh seed against the Knicks. And that, that to me, is a toss-up of a series, as good as the Knicks have been, because Joel Embiid is that kind of player. Absolutely. Somehow, we're... I don't know if it's action just since the game's ended or if the line was set here, but Philly minus four and a half is actually one of the most skewed lines of any of these play-ins yeah. so far, which is uh, surprising to me given some of the Lakers stuff we talked about and everything else. But yeah, that, that I think speaks to a large part of it. I mean, to me, Wes, I know you've been beating this drum all year on, on your local show and everything, but the best blueprint I can come up with, given some of the r rocky integration process we've seen from Embiid, I think largely has been on the defensive end. Mm-hmm. If Jimmy Butler can live at the basket, maybe get him force him beat into some panicky, you know, slap fouls and just being out of position and punish him inside, we know how that can go. We know what that can do and slow the game down and create free throw disparity and get teams into foul trouble and bonus situations and all that stuff. But that's a huge if for a guy who really has not proven that that's on the plate on the table any time this year for any consistent stretch. Yeah, Jimmy Butler, you look, and the playoff Jimmy thing exists until it doesn't anymore. And he's 34 years old. And so it, one day that he's that that switch isn't going to be able to get flipped. It's just going to happen. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, and we're not going to know until it's too late. So that's part of it too. And even in the past when we've sort of seen that flip switch into playoff Jimmy mode, there have been like portions of the regular season, like pockets of like a week or two where he would just be like flat out dominant, just a proof of concept. Hey, I could still do it at the level I need to get to. Let me just show it. Let me do it. Let me put it out there and just let let everybody know I'm coming. And we haven't gotten that at all this entire season from Jimmy Butler. And I know he's missed a couple of games with injuries. There have been some personal things happening in his life that he's had to miss some games, but he's played enough games here where that should have happened at some point, and we never really saw it. Um, and so that would be the thing that would give me – uh, reason for concern for the Heat. Like, yeah. why, you know, there's a lot of people in Miami, like you mentioned, uh, that they're like, oh, no, no, they, they, they don't care about the playoffs or they don't care about the regular season. They only care until the playoffs come around and, and Jimmy Butler is just saving it. And I'm just like, saving what? I don't, I, I just don't know what it is that he's saving. And it would have been nice to just not be in the playing tournament at all. And this team was trying not to be in the playing tournament. So, you know, the narrative that they don't care about the regular season, I thought was always largely overstated. And uh, they're in the playing tournament because of injuries, number one. 
but also because their star player and Jimmy Butler just hasn't played like that all season. And if he had for even a two week stretch, that would have just that would have been enough to get out and, and at least be the sixth seed in the East. And and he just wasn't able to muster that when they really needed him to. So there's that part of it. And in in this specific matchup, I'm also really worried about Tyrese Maxey if I'm the Heat. He has, I mean, he's torching a lot of teams. He's really torching the Heat this year too. So you've got Bam. He's going to go on an island against Joel Embiid for better or worse. That is going to be Miami's overall strategy. Now, when Embiid puts the ball on the ground, do they start sending doubles, you know, later in the shot clock? Like, they'll do all that stuff. But primarily, it'll be Bam handling Embiid. They don't really have a guy who can handle uh, Maxi. Maxi torched them the last time these guys met. If he goes off for, like, 37 points, this that might just be curtains on this game, and that could be it. And, and I don't really know what that second layer is that Miami has. Like, let's say Jimmy Butler does sort of summon playoff Jimmy okay maybe that's enough to cancel out what you get from uh, a working still back into the swing of things Joel Embiid but like who's going toe-to-toe with Tyrese Maxey at that point I know that's very like you know it's not exactly how basketball works but yeah but it's it's not inaccurate right I think Maxey is a going to be fascinating to watch in this game though because so much of what the Heat do relies on because they're not huge they're not always the most athletic in the way they build their roster. Their defensive effectiveness, whether they're in zone or just guarding things straight up, comes from strength and positioning, right? They're going to take away driving lanes. They're going to take away where you want to be, and they're going to execute that based on the p- personnel they're going up against better than anybody else. But the best way to beat that is for the ball to move quicker than the people can. And in right. some cases, that's ball movement, like we saw with Denver. In some cases, that's Tyrese Maxey holding onto it and dribbling it through that defense, right? So I, I think his quickness and his sh- the fact that he has the pull-up three, so you, he's less predictable, that just poses a problem for a defense that kind of maybe doesn't have swarming help at the basket right. and, and some of those other things that you know other teams might, Miami doesn't. So... I think this will be a competitive game, yes. but I think Philadelphia, we, we agree too much on this, but that's all right. They're the play-in games. That's <laughs> kind of how it goes. Just two injury notes on this one is Duncan Robinson, Terry Rozier didn't play in the season uh, closer uh, on Sunday, and their status for this game is still sort of TBD. So just worth monitoring while Philly seems mostly healthy at this point. For sure. All right. Atlanta, Chicago. I just have two questions at, by way of a preview here. Which team... Care? Oh, okay. <laughs> would be more fun to watch again, whether that is in the, in a second play in game or as an eight seed, no, which would uh, be more fun to watch a second time. No, give me Chicago. Give me the Alex okay. Caruso defense show. I can nerd out on that. And then DeMar DeRozan, like who doesn't like watching DeMar DeRozan still like that guy's just, he knows how to score. And that that's enough entertainment there. That Bulls team, you know, Torrey Craig, Andre Drummond, low lights aside from the other night is more fun than that organization deserves. And they've Correct. continued against all odds to be very watchable mm-hmm. and pretty entertaining and competitive despite the organization trying its best for that not to be the case. And so I agree with you as far as entertainment value, but I'm actually rooting against it so that they don't get rewarded in any small way <laughs> even to play one more game. But all right, number the second question. Which team is more likely to blow it up if they lose? The one that's telling you that it's going to. The Atlanta Hawks are the one that are going to probably make changes, regardless of even how this game plays out. They're probably going to make wholesale changes in terms of trading one of their guards, Trey Young or DeJounte Murray, where everybody knows that the Chicago Bulls are supposed to blow this up, but they keep telling everybody that listens that they're not ready to do that either. So it's the one that keeps telling you that they're going to blow it up. Yeah. Do you think Quinn Snyder would be part of that blow up so soon after coming in? <sighs> That's been a part of it that I'm, this I'm unsure still of. still love Atlanta? Because that was like the reason they were there in the first place. So if yeah. she's like, you know what? It's been a couple of years. I've I've mostly seen it. Uh, yeah. Maybe let's go somewhere else. Kentucky? No, probably not. I don't think the you know. I think Quinn's budget probably can fit multiple glasses frames. Right. But so the red were, the red does kind of hold him to Atlanta. So I would want to at least have that arranged. Maybe have an order in with the eye doctor mm. before switching teams or or or, or leaving because then the red just becomes kind of, you know, obnoxious. If we're being honest. I mean, you could really only go to Chicago or Portland because Houston's not firing their coach. And I'm not saying Chicago or Portland, but like let's say Billy Donovan, like the Kentucky noise around him is still sort of there. Like what what maybe he goes? I don't think he will, but let's say he does. Yeah, then, there you go. Then you could still wear the red glasses. But to your point, like, 
why wouldn't he just move to Charlotte and get the those teal glasses? Like we could we could just make this a thing. The accessories yeah, for Quinn Snyder. At this point, it's just the collage. More he could. I don't think he ever rocked the neon orange in Utah. That was a missed opportunity. But yeah. just start picking them up. Quinn would Probably be would his be biggest my advice. regret in his coaching career right now is not having the orange rooms when he could have. Yeah, a lot of other things in 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 Utah Jazz recent history notwithstanding. All right, let's go to uh, the final question of our show, which is now that we've previewed all these games and we're coming off of a season last year where the Lakers went to the conference finals out of this and the Miami Heat went to the NBA finals out of this play-in tournament, which team in either conference in any of these games has the best chance to pull what the Lakers and Heat did last year and make a relatively deep playoff run? So the answer is the Philadelphia 76ers for all the reasons we already laid out. But I would like to pose this question to the question you just asked me. If I'm in the West, the Oklahoma City Thunder ended up with the number one seed. Denver ended up at number two. If you're one of these playing teams, let's say you're the Lakers, and you are favored by one point according to the odds uh, over the Pelicans, do you tank this game and just try to get the eighth seed? Because Mm -hmm. as good as the Thunder are, and they are very good, your chances of beating them versus your chances of beating Nugget, the Nuggets are very different. Like, I, if I'm the Lakers, I would much rather see the Thunder in a first-round series than Denver. I, we might not be done with shenanigans, Brendan. We might not be done with the shenanigans. Let's see what happens. Game eighty-three shenanigans game. trophy. Yeah. Game eighty-three shenanigans trophy. So if so, to answer, so the East Coast, the the Eastern Conference, the Sixers. That's your answer. And there's mm-hmm. no, I don't think that there's any debating that. In the West. I would say whichever team ends up with the eighth seed, because whichever one gets the seventh seed is is dead on arrival. Like, that one's over. Mm. I like the way you're thinking. I I don't think you can ever lose a game on purpose in a single elimination environment. Um, that that uh, sounds a little suspiciously like Mike Greenberg suggesting the Lakers should tank one of the games in a playoff series last year and rest their guys and, and come back home Rested and healthy, I think, was was his goal there. Too too much tempting fate for for my liking, despite agreeing that the Thunder are, are definitely the team I would rather face, and especially if you're the Lakers, right? We've already seen how that goes. They got swept. There's really no mystery. They haven't right. changed their team much. They were healthy last time around, so were, so was Denver. That would be the case again. So it will be a, a disappointment if the Lakers run into that again, but I don't think you can intentionally lose because, well, you know, then what? You're, you're, you're running up against Steph Curry and you feel great about that? I mean, that's not awesome either. So what if it's not an intentional loss, but maybe stuff just works out sometimes for some people? All right, we already agreed that the Lakers are a tough matchup for the Pelicans, right? So we, we both picked the Lakers yeah. in that playing game. That makes the Pelicans have to play the winner of the Kings-Warriors game. I think the Pelicans are better than both of those teams, so let's let's okay. say the Pelicans win that. Then all of a sudden, you end up with exactly the matchup that you were hoping to get if you were the Pelicans. Because your best matchup out of the sort of Oklahoma City, Denver, Minnesota group is Oklahoma mm-hmm. City. And so I think my answer in the Western in the in the Western conference of which team can in this playing tournament can make the deep run, I got the Pelicans. Mm-hmm. And I know that ESPN's gonna say the Lakers and the Warriors, and they're gonna want to keep talking about those teams. And yeah, those teams have chances. You never rule out LeBron or Steph or those guys, but of the four teams in the playing tournament, I think the Pelicans are easily the best team in that group. And if they lose that Lakers game, I kind of feel a little bit better about it. Yeah, it's funny. You're telling me that as I've spent the past several weeks as a having a vested interest covering the Suns, wanting the best outcomes for them, that they avoid the Oklahoma City Thunder because OKC has absolutely spanked the Suns all season. Right. But in theory, that is probably the group you would want to face because of their inexperience, because you kind of want to get them on the first go round and, and well, everything match up else. Too, right? like but if Minnesota, you're the Pelicans, I still think I would want to face them. Well, even, if though, I, even if, if you're the Pelicans? I mean, that can't happen now, but... Right. Yeah, I, I think I so, because New Orleans doesn't quite have that interior advantage that you would like against Oklahoma City. And I think... OKC does have hmm. some options against Zion, bodies at least that Lou Dort, uh, Aaron Wiggins, Jalen Williams. They usually they have Jaylen some wings Williams on them. They do. Yeah. I, I would say Zion is that interior presence. Like I'm not. I wouldn't. Yeah, pick yeah, the yeah, Pelicans. yeah. That's fair. I wouldn't. I wouldn't pick the Pelicans in that series. But if you had to like go up against one of those top teams, because going into today it was one of Minnesota, Denver, Oklahoma City. We're going to end up 
uh, with the top seed. So I just I think if you had to pick a matchup, if you were the Pelicans, then you would pick Oklahoma City. I would still take the Thunder in that series. Um, I'm just. I don't to remember of any of those games, of which is part of where my I'm like, did I watch them? Did I see <laughs> New Orleans, Oklahoma City this year? Can I can I pull from that? I don't know if I can. Uh, all right, last question. Then to go back to the East. Early, very early. We haven't even seen Philly win this game yet. What do you think of Philly Knicks? Oh, uh, exciting. Uh, we got Joel Embiid at Madison Square Garden. We've got Jalen Brunson trying to take down those monsters, uh, a team that's just slightly bigger than them. I don't like, I hesitate to, to think about it too much because we're not there yet, but I just, that, uh, whoever wins that one can be the team that ends up in the Eastern conference finals. Absolutely. I think it would be the betting favorite. Yeah. I don't think that's a for sure. Favorite. I think Philly, uh, the noise of team that has a star that the Knicks have very, very limitedly been connected to going to play them in a playoff series is giving me bad kind of Lakers energy and some of those awful fan bases over the years, yours included, Wes, who just kind of, you know, swallow up meaningful basketball moments with X guy will be part of my team before long kind of dialogue. But, you know, we, we have plenty of time to get to before we get to that. So that will wrap us up here. Lots of playoff talk. We are hyped. I'm sure you are as well. Enjoy the playing games. We'll be back with you, I would imagine, post-game Tuesday night to get you uh, all caught up on the first round of games. And we'll be here three times a week with you all throughout the postseason. Don't forget to hit follow or subscribe to get a new show in your feed three times a week. And we will catch you next time.